Welcome to episode number 11 of the Road to Cinema podcast, featuring Oscar-nominated director and screenwriter Peter Bogdanovich. The Last Picture Show, an adaptation of Larry McMurtry's novel, was released in 1971. The film received two Academy Award nominations for Peter Bogdanovich, including Best Director and Best Adapted Screenplay. Newsweek magazine described the film as the most impressive work from a young American director since Citizen Kane. On today's episode, we discuss Peter Bogdanovich's new film, She's Funny That Way, which premiered last September at the Venice Film Festival. The film stars Owen Wilson, Imogen Poots, Jennifer Aniston, Austin Peddleton, Sybil Shepard, and an all-star cast of comedians, which also includes Richard Lewis and Will Forte. We discuss the development and production of She's Funny That Way, along with the importance of Peter Bogdanovich's early work as an editor. Many people may not realize, but he edited his first two films, Targets and The Last Picture Show. We also discuss a book Mr. Bogdanovich is currently working on called My First Picture Show, A Director's Apprenticeship, which includes diary entries from his early days in Hollywood in the 1960s and early 1970s, and a film Mr. Bogdanovich is currently developing and working on called Wait For Me. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, to read the Road to Cinema blog, and to watch our Road to Cinema YouTube series, please visit jogroadproductions.com. And you can follow us on Twitter for the latest updates, at jogroad. And now we join filmmaker Peter Bogdanovich as he discusses the premiere of She's Funny That Way at last September's Venice Film Festival. So first, I wanted to congratulate you on the amazing reception of uh, She's Funny That Way at the Venice Film Festival, and uh, I believe you received a standing ovation after the film ended. Yes, it was quite extraordinary. Owen Wilson was there with me, <clears throat> and uh, we got a, I said it was about five, six, seven minutes. Owen said ten minutes, and I said, really? <laughs> and then... Uh, Producer, I said to the producer, well, Owen thinks it's 10 minutes. She said, he's right, it was. I timed it. <laughs> uh, what did that feel like uh, coming back to Venice? Because you had They All Laughed and St. Jack at the festival uh, many years ago. Uh, Venice has been good to me. Venice has been good to me. It's a good, not very nice people, as the Italians often usually are. Um, contrary to popular myth. <laughs> anyway, um, no, they're very nice. And Venice is a golden place. I mean, it's just like, you just can't believe anybody could have thought to have a city on the water. And, it, and it's just striking. Yeah. And so, in my, instead of my blog, it's like a dreamscape, you know? And no wonder, uh, no wonder um, George Clooney went there for his honeymoon. I, I, it's a great place for honeymoon. It's a great place for movies, too, because movies are a kind of magic, and the city is, it has a kind of magic to it. Definitely. And Italy has such a great film history with uh, you know Fellini, Antonioni, so many great filmmakers to come out there. Yeah, there were a lot of, a lot of them. Uh, and I was going to ask uh, about the development of She's Funny That Way, because I believe the script goes back to the late 1990s when you wrote it with, uh, with uh, Louise Stratton. And I believe you even had John Ritter. Uh, you were thinking about using him for the role that would eventually go to Owen Wilson uh, before he passed away. That's all correct. We wrote it uh, right at the end of the 90s, uh, 98, 99, in there. Uh, it took us a year or two because we, we were traveling and we had a lot of bad times. And then I went bankrupt in 97, so it was... It was, a, it was a difficult time, and to sort of cheer ourselves up, we wrote a we wrote a script, uh, and we put it on. As I often do when I'm doing a script, uh, we put it on index cards, the basic sequences, and we put them on a bulletin board. And then the reason I still talk about how we used to travel around, going from place to place, carrying this bulletin board with cards on it, uh, pin pin to 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 it. So anyway, that's, that's how we worked on the script. John Ritter and Sue were going to do it. We wrote it by speaking it. She would say something, I would say something, and, and then it would be typed by Iris Chester, who was at that point in South Carolina. 
She used to work for me in LA, but at that point she was and was still doing some work for me, but she was in South Carolina. So we'd we'd fax our our pages. The, I mean, we'd we'd FedEx the the cassette tapes that we made to her, and then she would type it up. And then we would correct it and rewrite it and so on, you know. And uh, that, that that was the process. And uh, it wasn't really as much writing until we. Actually, had a first draft, then we could look, print it out and see what we think about fixing up some of the dialogue or whatever. And we just kept playing with it. And then John Ritter and Sybil read it, and they were going to do it as husband and wife. And um, John had a hit series, Eight Simple Rules. And uh, I was on it, on it, the, on the episode that. Uh, he didn't complete that he died on Thursday. We were shooting it on Friday. Uh, We've yeah. been rehearsing it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I spent all week with him. And uh, Thursday, I heard he wasn't feeling well, and he, he, he didn't come out of his dressing room for a long time. And then Friday, I heard he was dead. Wow. That, that was right when they were, uh, they were rehearsing and about to film the show. About to shoot the show, yeah. We rehearsed Monday, mm. Tuesday, Wednesday. And Thursday he didn't feel well and uh, didn't come out on the set. And I, everybody saw what's that all about. And then they took him to the hospital and uh, he died Friday, I think. Anyway, we never shot the show. And uh, I lost a really, really great friend. One of the great friends of my life. And he also uh, had acted in the Noises Off, and they all laughed, and uh, you know, incredible contributions to those films. And he was great in Nickelodeon, too. I mean, he's just terrific. Nickelodeon was, was the first big part in the big picture that he got. And I had remembered him because he had read for me for the last picture show. And uh, for the Sonny, the part of Sonny, which Timothy Lyon was played. And uh, Ritter uh, would have been great in it. And, uh, Is it true that also his father had auditioned for the role of Ben the Lion? Yeah, uh, Sam the Lion. Oh, Sam right. the Lion, yeah. Ex Ritter, right. Uh, he came in with John. And they needed an audition, but I just met with him. We had a very nice chat. And I saw John once or twice for the part, in fact, in my diary. And one entry that I kept, which is which I'm publishing short, but I'll tell you about that later. Um, I wrote that I had decided to use him. And then something happened. Anyway, uh, and then you, it was full of regret. Oh, that you had cast uh, Timothy Bottoms uh, in that role. Uh, and then, so as you were developing the screenplay, uh, what was your intention as far as uh, the tone of the story? Uh, because it's sort of a, it's a screwball comedy from what I understand. Well, it is a screwball comedy, but it's less screwball than, say, What's Up, Doc? Uh, it's, 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 it's a bit more grounded in reality. What's Up, Doc? was definitively a cartoon. I mean, even the title tells you that. Uh, it was very cartoonish and, and broad. And, uh, and, and we told the audience it's a screwball comedy, so we went screwball. And, um, and it worked. Biggest success of my career, and it was made on a dare. <laughs> and... Um, this picture is, is more grounded in reality. Also, the topic is a little bit closer to the bone because it's about an escort who becomes a movie star. And um, and Owen Wilson, the director, has an affair with her and pay, pays her a lot of money not to be uh, an escort anymore because she should do something else with her life. And he gives her 30 grand. And then she, she wants to be an actress, so she, he, she knows him under another name, and she comes to audition for the play he's directing on Broadway with his wife. So you can imagine the complications that possibly could ensue from that. 
Uh, definitely. And uh, casting Owen Wilson, uh, you know, he had a great turn a couple years ago in Midnight in Paris with Woody Allen. And uh, he's he has such a, an earnest quality to him. Uh, what made you uh, want to cast Owen for that role? Well, when I first met Owen <clears throat> some years back, uh, at a party, I spent about 10 minutes talking to him, 10, 15 minutes of talking with him. We first met, I can't remember exactly if we were introduced by Wes or if it was somebody else introduced us, but basically we met at a party. And from uh, after spending maybe 15 minutes talking to him, I thought to myself, this kid is a real star. He just is, he's just a star personality. With his broken nose and his slight twang, and uh, it, it's just, he's like Jimmy Stewart. You know, you, you just, you, you like him. And he has the personality, and he's a good actor, as Jimmy Stewart indeed was a great actor, too. And Owen's a great actor, and, he, and a terrific writer, because we, we forget that Owen and Wes wrote the first three Wes Anderson pictures, uh, Rushmore and um, Bottle Rocket. He had Lib's lines in the scene, and they're terrific, you know. I mean, he just does it. And, and uh, <laughs> you're crazy if you don't use it, and it's usually great. The ensemble cast for the film... Uh, is really incredible as well. You have Imogen Poots, Jennifer Aniston, Austin Pendleton, Will Forte, Richard Lewis. What were some of the sort of uh, casting decisions made from there? I believe Austin Pendleton worked with you in What's Up, Doc? Yeah, Austin was was was, uh, was very funny in What's Up, Doc. He played Larrabee, the, the rich guy who's putting putting up the the, uh, the grant. Uh, that everybody's after. Um, he was brilliant. He's very, very funny in that. And uh, I always wanted to work with him again. In fact, the part was written for, for all. I wrote it with him in mind, as I did the part that George Morphogan plays, the detective. And um, I rewrote the uh, Owen, Owen's part for Owen, because uh, he, he's more sophisticated than John. And uh, we didn't, we didn't, we couldn't, we, we didn't think it, it would work to have too much, too much physical humor, which isn't his thing anyway. But he's quite good at it because there is a little bit of it in the picture. But we, but we, we, we styled that more for Owen. We toned down some of the slapstick. Reader, reader was, was uh, you know, moved uh, probably the best, uh, the best moves of any comedian since Buster Keaton. I mean, he. He really had great moves as a, as a, as a comedian, but that was a special thing for John, which, uh, yeah, you know, when you change the leading man and they're both stars, you have to accommodate the one who's playing it. Uh, and so we rewrote the script, uh, not tremendously, but we wrote it for Owen. Uh, so that was, that was, and we had great luck with Ray Seafons, who, uh, who we cast at the last minute. I think I met him on a Sunday and we shot with him on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't find anybody. We tried a lot of different star actors. The whole joke is that this character, he's a movie star doing Broadway. And uh, he um, he's English. Well, actually, we didn't, we didn't know. We, we tried a lot of actors. Top actors, you know, Benicio del Toro, uh, uh, the guy in the silver lining's playbook. Uh, Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper, and uh, and a couple other people, and they all shied away from it. We talked to uh, oh Jason Stratham, who was very interested in doing it until he read it, and he said, "No, you can't do that." Good work. I don't know how to do that <laughs> because it was tricky. Uh, you're sending yourself up to a degree by playing a kind of conceited, egotistical, clever, rather brilliant, actually, actor. Uh, but it's also you have to be willing to kid yourself a little bit, you know. So um, some of the actors shied away from that. 
And uh, then George Jacoulias, who was one of the producers on the picture, and I had worked with him already on the the uh, the running running down a dream, the uh, Tom Petty documentary we did that uh, won a Grammy a few years back. Uh, for our documentary, and George uh, said, "What about Reese Evans?" I said, "Well, at least he was in Notting Hill. I, I remember him." Well, that's very different from what we've been thinking about, which is a kind of a matinee idol. He said, yeah, but you could sort of play the same dialogue and let him be a kind of rock star, movie star. You know, with his hair down his face and uh, wearing the loose shirts that are falling off or whatever, you know. I mean, uh, <clears throat> carries a dog around with him, a miniature of the small dog that she carries around with him all the time. And um, when Reese came in and he, and he just killed, killed the part, he just was fabulous. Fabulous performance. And he was also in a picture Noah Baumbach made called... Um, oh, Greenberg. I, I think he played uh, the best friend. Is that right? Exactly. And he's, yeah. just, he's a terrific actor. And in this thing, he's just priceless. Some of his expressions and his takes are gold. It's golden. Yeah, definitely. Uh, he's a great uh, character actor. Um, yeah, he loved him in, in Venice. I mean, they, they, he brought down the house a few times. Uh, I was wondering, as well as the, uh, the development of the film and sort of getting to that first day of shooting, I know that uh, the film was made in the independent film world and uh, with Holly Warsmer and also uh, Cassie and Ellis. Uh, I was sort of wondering the process of uh, developing the film and, you know, really, uh, you know, getting to that first day of shooting. Well, it, it moved rather swiftly at a certain point. What happened was we had the script, and both Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach had read the script for quite a while before. And I said, I want to do it with Owen. Would you guys produce it? And uh, they said, yeah. So we went to, uh, you know, they're my sons. I call them Son Noah and Son Wes. And they call me Pop. They're the only ones allowed to do that, <laughs> like my children. And, and um, they said, sure. And they got in touch with UTA, their agency. And UTA started to put the package together. And we got Jennifer uh, as UTA was working on putting the package together. And uh, we had Owen, we had, I said we had Owen, we got Jennifer, and uh, then uh, the picture was basically on, and uh, we, uh, they got the money, to, uh, UTA brought, um, it was a little complicated. Uh, there are a number of people involved. My daughter was involved. Uh, and uh, it went to a guy named Jeff Rice, whom I had met some years before. And we got along. We sat in one of those Hollywood Night of a Thousand Stars benefit or something. We sat next to each other and exchanged looks and talked. And I liked him very much. And so when he heard from, from an associate of his that I was doing a comedy, he jumped up and said, I want to be, I want to be involved with that. So then he and I met, and then um, he brought a number of people to the table, and, and the main producers were Holly Riesma and uh, Logan Levy, who, who were the, you know, the on-the-spot producers, and also were involved in getting the financing together, along with Cassian Elways. Uh, who was really brilliant at all that. So, and then uh, eventually the CAA got involved as well. And uh, the whole thing came together there rather quickly at that point. From, from the point where we started, where well, Wes and Noah said they produced it for me, uh, as they already think they produced it for me, uh, <clears throat> from that point on, we, we had a deal pretty quickly. And uh, we, I wouldn't say it was more than Few months, a couple of months. Wow, that's incredible. Uh, you know, definitely. Um, you began, uh, you know, working with Roger Corman and sort of the independent world. And you, uh, your second film was at Columbia Pictures, a big uh, 
you know, sort of a, under the studio auspices. Uh, so what was it like uh, working on this film and has the production process of filming day to day on a set uh, changed for you over the years? No, not really. Not really. Um, I mean, we had a very, we had a very tight schedule. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money, and, we, and worse, we had not a lot of time. We shot the whole picture in, on the streets of New York and interiors of New York in uh, twenty nine days. Wow, twenty nine days. Yeah, that's fast. So what happens is, I, I've done, luckily, I spend to the 90s doing films for television and, and cable and specials. Uh, and I, and uh, you know, I'd have 24 days to do a, an hour and a half or two hours. <laughs> days, 24 days, one time 19 days to do, to, to, to do two full hours. <laughs> and you learn to do it you know you learn to do it without sacrificing quality by moving faster everything really has to just be faster that's why you just can't take as much time you got to plan ahead and shoot fast and you got to get good actors who don't hold you up and we had that in this picture and we got that actually we came in on the schedule and on the budget too yeah what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, you began as an editor in a way because the first two films you made targets and the last picture show you were an uncredited editor and uh, I believe you sort of have developed this process where you cut in the camera and when you're shooting you really know how every shot is going to connect uh, when you're in the editing room well that's correct it's, it's called cutting in the camera and it used to be the, the average way of doing pictures uh, not the exception, uh, because in the studio era, <clears throat> in the studio era, it was often extremely tight in terms of how much you could shoot and how long you could take to shoot it. And, uh, and also studios, uh, and producers sometimes exercise their powers and recut the picture. And so directors came to realize, a lot of directors, Hitchcock, Hawks, Ford, even I say even Orson Welles, because Orson was newer to the game when he, when he got into it. But uh, most directors, not all directors, but most of the really good directors uh, uh, cut in the camera. And uh, it, was, it was economical. You didn't shoot stuff you weren't going to use. Uh, you, you knew how it all fit together. It was easy to put together. I think they had a post on the Grapes of Wrath, but I think from the time they finished shooting till it opened was a month. Wow. <laughs> I think so. So, now I've been usually usually very, very fast in post-production because I cut my hair with the so. So on What's Up Talk, for example, or Paper Moon, uh, we showed the studio the picture three weeks after we wrapped shooting, three weeks, with, with, with music. And uh, and we came in under budget on both of those pictures, slightly. And, uh, Jesus, I was a hero. <laughs> no, I mean, that's incredible. Uh, I mean, as you hear, you know, today, certainly, it's uh, not, you know, generally the style of... Uh, of shooting very economically and really having a great understanding for what's going into the shooting day. Some people tend to show up and just uh, sort of, you know, shoot every scene from every possible angle. But I think there's a great uh, artistry in being precise and really uh, knowing what you're uh, coming into the shooting day with, with the intention of getting. Well, it helps the actors a lot because they know what they're going to do. They, they know, okay, we're going to do a close-up of this, then we're going to cut back and do a wide shot of this whole section. And then they say, well, are you going to cover it? No, no, no. We just do it once and we do a master and that'll be it. Uh, move, might move the camera a little bit. We'll see. And um, they say, I remember with River Phoenix, poor, sweet, beautiful River Phoenix. Uh, 
God, he was talented. Anyway, um, I said to him one time, we're, we're going to do this scene. It's about four pages, four and a half pages. We're going to do it in one shot, River. You guys are you know, in the kitchen. You walk around, and there's, 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 whatever the scene was. It's about four or five pages. He said, I said, well, he said, okay, then we'll, you got the master. Then, we'll, then we want to, what are you going to shoot? I said, no, that's it. <laughs> what do you mean? I said, we're shooting the whole scene in one take, on one shot. Uh, four or five pages, and uh, once we get it right, that'll be it. We go home. <laughs> he said, you're kidding. I said, hasn't anybody worked like that? He said, well, yeah, Sydney worked like that a little bit. From that, he said he was pretty, he was pretty, he pretty much knew where it was going to go, but usually they make you do it from every angle. Uh, I, I said, well, we're not going to do that. He was thrilled. He, he, would, he would come in in the morning and he'd say, can we do it in one? And I said, no, we can't, we can't do this one. Well, no, can't do it in every scene, River. <laughs> I love But, uh, you know, I once asked Orson Welles, I said, well, what do you think is the difference between cutting cutting up a scene or playing it all in one, one shot? And uh, Orson said, well, we used to say that's what separated the men from the boys. <laughs> And you can definitely see in uh, in Orson's films, uh, you know, especially Citizen Kane, uh, the economy and the way he shoots, and and also uh, the great staging of the scenes, which I think is really inspired in your work as well, where you have actors in foreground, midground, background, and they either move within the frame or the camera can move around them, and uh, it's just really beautiful compositions. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's all about moving pictures, you know. Uh, the camera is, is important. It's, it's making a movie, and but it's sometimes it's important to just let it let it record the events without without commenting on it and editing. It's true that I cut targets and uh, picture show myself. And I learned an enormous amount. I also cut large sections of. Uh, the, the, the stuff I shot, I also cut on the Wild Angels, Roger Corman's picture, which I uh, rewrote about eighty percent of it and shot second unit and first unit as well. I worked with Peter and Nancy. I helped Roger. I shot a lot of. It was Roger was great help to me because he gave me the opportunity to do just about everything you can do in a picture, including direct uh, on the Wild Angels because I worked. So I, I shot for three weeks as a director. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he shot for three weeks as director. I was doing I was doing action, and uh, and then and then one day after we finished shooting, I finished three weeks of shooting. He says to me, Monty says your stuff doesn't cut. I said, M M Monty Hellman was a cutter and, uh, and a filmmaker, but he was cutting this one. He was the editor. Yeah, I believe he directed uh, Tulane Blacktop. Exactly. So uh, he says, Money says it doesn't cut. I said, What do you mean it doesn't cut? I don't know what Roger said. He just says it doesn't cut. I said, Well, I don't know. I didn't look at it. He said, of course it cuts. So I went down and looked at it, and it was all cut wrong. So I said to Roger, Well, it's all cut wrong. He said, Well, then you cut it. <laughs> And I said, well, I don't know how to cut it. I don't know how to use this machine. Don't you know how to use an editing machine? I said, no. Well, for God's sake, well, go downstairs, and Dennis Jacob will show you how to use it. It's really easy. He'll show you how to do it. And then I'll have a, I'll have a, a, a movieola and a bin uh, delivered out to your house, and you can finish cutting it there. <laughs> <laughs> So it was really a, a crash course in, in how to uh, in how to use editing equipment and really delve into uh, the craft of editing. Yeah, I mean, Dennis Jacob, who was an editor, took him about 45 minutes to explain the situation to me, a little less, in terms of the machinery. And uh, then we took him out to my house in Van Nuys, California, and uh, where I was living to my first wife, uh, Polly Glass. And um, so, in fact, 
I, that's how I got to, to make targets because I learned an enormous amount from Roger, and I also he also felt that I had helped him quite a bit on the picture, and so he wanted to give me the shot to direct my own picture, and uh, gave me some prerequisites, and that's what uh, the, uh, one of them was that he had to use Boris I had to use Boris Karloff who owed him two days' work, and. Uh, that became Target, which was, unfortunately, sadly, Boris's last film. He always used to refer to it as the last film. Even though he made a, he made a guest appearances in a couple of Z-budget pictures afterward, he didn't, he didn't count those. Anyway, uh, I can't remember what, about what started this conversation, but, that, but yes, I, I learned an enormous amount by editing those films myself. And uh, Picture Show, of course, a lot. I learned an enormous amount, too, of course. One helped the other. I was able to cut Picture Show faster than I would have had to cut Angels and my stuff in Angels and, uh, and uh, Targets. Yeah. How do you think uh, the editing process affected uh, She's Funny that way in terms of how you wrote the original script and how it developed from shooting and then eventually uh, cutting the film? We, uh, we we shot a little bit more than we needed, uh, and uh, the producers had a voice. Everybody had a voice. Uh, it was very democratic, uh, and we finally what, what, we, what we all agreed was the best version is what it ended, it ended up being, and that's what's out there. Now. That's what played in Venice. Wow. And uh, is there a release date uh, say yet for the film? Uh, the, the last I heard, it was going to be in March. The book that uh, I believe is coming out soon, uh, I guess it's based on the diaries uh, that you had in the early 70s? Well, I've been working on it for some time, and I'm not absolutely positive uh, when it's going to come out, because it's, it's a big book. But I... Um, I've owed it to the publisher for for some time. I've been working on this. I've been working on this book for a long time. It's called My First Picture Show: A Director's Apprenticeship, an Intimate Journal by. And from nineteen, from the middle of nineteen sixty-five. Let me, get, let me sketch in where I am at that point. This is exactly almost a year to the day that we arrived in Los Angeles, uh, Polly and I. And um, she suggested I keep a diary, a daily diary. And so we acquired one. And I started keeping, I thought, okay, that's a good idea. And I kept a diary, and the second day of the diary, a second entry, I meet Roger Corman, <laughs> who started my career, you know, in pictures, by asking me to write a script for him. And then first to write a script for him, which I didn't finish until much later, and then to work on The Wild Angels with him. And uh, that was that was the beginning of my movie career. So uh, the... Uh, diary really covers from the middle of 65, 1965, <clears throat> to the middle of 1971. Now, what happens during that period is that I, uh, I, I work on the Wild Angels, I work on, I make targets, uh, uh, we have two children, my father dies during the making of the last picture show. My marriage breaks up because I fall in love with Sybil. All that is in that period. Oh. And so it's a lot of... And, and I said, I, I don't know if I said like my father died during that period, too, on the, during the last picture show. <clears throat> so... Uh, and my marriage broke up, as I said. So it was a wild period. A lot of things happened. I had two daughters, you know. My life changed remarkably during that period. Um, uh, that includes my going to Italy to work on the Sergio Leone movie, which I didn't do, because Sergio and I didn't get along. Uh, 
Oh, wow. What movie uh, was that for Sergio Leone? Yes, for Sergio Leone. I think it was released as A Fistful of Dynamite. Oh, wow. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> no, it wasn't with Clint, Clint. I think it was with Rod Steiger and Jim Coburn. Okay. It may have been called Duck You Sucker somewhere. Yeah, that sounds familiar. I think uh, I think it might be under that title. Yeah. He says to me when I got to Rome, that's uh, what you say, no? He's an exp- American expression, no? Duck You Sucker. I said, no, I never heard it before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this book uh, covers that period because it it includes a lot of entries from that period, uh, as well as, you see, I kept a a card file, uh, a card file of everything I saw uh, from the time I was 12 and a half, from 1952 until through 1970. So in the diary, I say things like, we went to see... Uh, Robin Hood, Alan Dwan's Robin Hood or something. And then in the card file, I write a comment about what I think about the film. So I've taken those comments and moved them into the body of the book. So, because it's a second diary, basically, a diary of every film I thought. Only it's a card file. You see what I mean? Yeah, I believe, uh, is that also on your uh, blog on IndieWire? You also have some of those posted as well? That's correct. Some of those uh, comments that you see on IndieWire on the blog, uh, the, the Hitchcock file, for example, has all my comments on Hitchcock's pictures. The Hawks file has all my comments on Hawks pictures. The Lubitsch file we've done. We've done the John Ford file. We, I think we're doing Vincent Minnelli next. Uh, it includes all my comments from the card file. Yeah, it's sort of interesting. Well, wow, it's incredible. So uh, the book will be will have uh, your your diary entries, and then in conjunction with uh, the cards, keeping a record of all the films that you had seen. Yeah, because in the diary, I, I went to see such and such, and then below the, below the entry is what I said about the movie uh, in the card file. Also, uh, there are long. Sometimes, sometimes long and sometimes short, but very pithy. Um, contemporary comments on the diary as it goes along. Oh, so you comment from present day uh, today on on your on your past entries? Exactly. You know, like I might say, well, that was ungenerous of me because he was a very generous person, and I think that my my comments about him and this are disgraceful or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting to uh, to reflect back like that. Uh, did you find that uh, difficult to sort of look at sort of the past and being able to comment on it? Did you find that uh, therapeutic in a sense or sort of? I don't know what. It, it, it's it's very, very uh, I don't know. You, 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 get, you get a lot of things off your chest. Um because you explain explain how you feel about certain things. I was, you know, I was young. I was, uh, I started the diary in 1965, uh, June of 65, and so I was 20, uh, I turned 26 that year, uh, in July. So I, I, I was 26, and then, um, when I stopped writing the diary in 71, I was uh, not quite uh, 32. Why do you think uh, you stopped writing your, your diary at that point? I also stopped the uh, card file at that point. Um, well, that's why it's called the director's apprenticeship. Uh, I, I, I didn't feel I had time for the diary. And I just had lost interest in keeping a track of it each day. I regret that now, but it was just something I, I just didn't want to do anymore. Maybe it's because I identified it with Polly and we broke up and it wasn't pleasant. Uh, maybe that's why, I don't know. But I just wasn't interested in keeping it anymore. Um, 
and the card file, I learned enough about the history of movies to, 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 to not have to keep track of the cards of movies any longer. I, I was seeing much less, far less movies than I'd ever seen before. And um, I just felt that uh, I, I, I didn't need to keep that card file any longer either. I was 31, I'd been doing it for 19 years. And I felt I, I'd graduated, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, sort of the, in a, in a sense, the way you, uh, spoke to so many directors and, uh, as it was documented in your book, uh, uh, who the, who the devil made it, uh, do you see directors now like Wes Anderson, Noah Baumbach, who come to you and, uh, ask you for advice on the films that they're making? They have sometimes, not always, but, uh, they have, yeah. And, um, I'm happy to help, you know. Oh, definitely. And uh, I was going to ask uh, if you have any projects uh, that you currently have in development right now that uh, you're working on. Yes, I'm going to do a ghost picture that I've been working on for 30 years, uh, maybe longer. I first had the idea to do it, and I wrote the first sequence which is completely different now, but this was in this was in November of 1980, so that's quite a long time ago. Wow! Uh, and I, I, it wasn't until 1993, <laughs> after having written a couple of drafts, it wasn't until 1993 that I realized I didn't have a third act, and I realized that when River Phoenix died because something happened that I'm not going to tell you about now, but uh, something that happened that made me realize that uh, it made me figure out a, a very powerful third act to this comedy drama. It's a comedy drama, really. It's not a screwball comedy. But it, it's written with the speed of a screwball comedy because they're constantly in movement. The characters, they're constantly moving by train, by car, uh, by walking, uh, by plane. They're constantly moving, and the whole picture plays in four or five days. And it's about, it's, it's set in Europe, and it's about, uh, it involves a director, producer, writer, star, somebody like Woody Allen or Orson Welles or John Cassavetes, somebody who writes his own pictures, directs direct them, but he's famous for comedy. And he's had six wives and six daughters. And uh, his, his, his sixth wife, um, whom he had been, whom he had loved when she was 18, uh, some years back, and fate kept him apart. He finally married her and she got killed in a plane crash six years before the movie begins. Mm. And uh, the movie finds him absolutely a complete mess. Uh, and um, his career is finished in Hollywood. He, he beat up a producer <laughs> <laughs> he chopped up a projection room, you know. Um, he's he's persona non grata in Hollywood, and he's trying to see if he can maneuver some Europeans into paying for his room and board while he tries to write another picture. That's the setup. Uh, but uh, the, 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 there's a six ghosts in the picture who are very friendly ghosts. Uh, but they, he has a major interplay with these ghosts. Um, and it's quite complicated because you meet all the wives, you meet all the daughters. The one of the daughters disappears. They don't know where she went. She was pregnant. And she, there's a lot of story. It's, it's, it's the most complicated picture I ever wrote in terms of number of characters. But I like movies with a lot of characters. But this one has to have an all-star cast. Because you you can't spend a lot of time explaining whoever each person is. They've got to be recognizable. Be uh, a major star playing the director, and then it'll be stars in the, as the wives, and 
millions of dollars. Well, you know, it sounds uh, it sounds like a great film, and uh, you know, I always look forward to uh, when I hear you have a film. Uh, you know, you had uh, the great Cat's Meow. Uh, in 2001 and you know you've done some great work since then uh, and you know it's great to see uh, She's Funny That Way coming out and you know really being a return to you to uh, to making uh, you know great films well thank you I, I hope you like it and I hope it does well I think it's a funny picture and wait for the, the picture the ghost picture I was telling you about is called Wait For Me and uh, that's my uh I think I think it could be in my best picture.